Hello and welcome everyone. Um, so welcome to uh, the webinar. Uh, we're just going to give it a few minutes for everyone to turn off. Uh, in the meantime, let me introduce the Tiger Global Case Competition 2021, which is Future of Mobility. So TGCC is the largest global virtual case competition for high school students. It's brought to you by principal partner Tiger Global Management, official sponsor PwC, and global partner M&G Investment, and it's powered by Crimson Education. So TGCC is an opportunity for students 13 to 18 years old to step into the shoes of consultants to solve a real business's challenge. So it's 100% virtual and you can compete from anywhere in the world. So you also have the opportunity to compete in best, to, to participate in best in class workshops to build your skills, to analyze a business case and present your solutions to a panel of live judges. So competitors will work in teams of two to four students to crack the case. Currently, there are more than 2,400 competitors from 60 countries. So that means there's over 780 teams in total, which is quite amazing. So registrations for TGCC 2021 will close on Tuesday, August the 3rd at 11.59 p.m. New York time. So don't miss out. We're just gonna give it a few more minutes for everyone to turn up and then we'll begin the webinar. Okay, great, let's get started. So I'll introduce myself. So my name is Henry. I'm currently a rising sophomore at the Warden School at the University of Pennsylvania. So TGCC is actually very special to me because I competed and we placed second in the 2018 Global Finals. So it's really great to be back and hosting this amazing panel today. So for me, actually, TGCC was what inspired me to consider a career in business and investing. So I hope that you enjoy this and get as much out of it as I did. So before we get started, a couple of housekeeping notes. So we will not be using the chat function. So please do not ask questions in the chat box. We will be using the Q&A box. So drop any questions you have there and you are able to upvote other questions as well. Uh, if you have questions about TGCC in general, please ask them. The TGCC team is on the line ready to answer your questions also in the Q&A box. Um, so we will have a live Q&A with our panelists for the final 20 minutes of the webinar. So please also drop your questions in the Q&A box for the live Q&A at the end. And remember to upvote existing questions if you have the same ones. So while I start to introduce our panel today, uh, we're going to drop a few polls to learn a little bit about who is joining us on the call today. So please answer those polls for us so we know who's with us today. So first I'll introduce Martin. So Martin is an experienced company director, venture capitalist, and investor in the technology and disruption field. So he's currently the director and partner in Asia Principal Capital, which is an Australian technology accelerator a non-executive independent board director at KPMG Australia, and an investment partner at various technology and health funds. Formerly, Martin held various chairman and managing director positions. His executive career extends over 30 years in technology, consumer, telco, and media with leading brands, including PBL, Optus, Dixon, Frank, PepsiCo, and IBM. He's also held non-executive director and alternate director roles within many of Australia's leading media and online brands. So next, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you all Lauren. So Lauren is an associate partner at McKinsey & Co, currently based out of Sydney. Day to day, she is responsible for the leadership of projects for McKinsey & Company. She typically delivers engagements for leading companies across Australia and New Zealand in industries such as financial services, retail and communications, and she has a strong background in corporate strategy, digital growth, and business building. Lauren graduated with an MBA from Stanford's Graduate School of Business in 2018. And lastly, I think uh, Kai might be joining us a bit later on. Um, he just might be here. In a, uh, I don't see him in the panel as of yet, but I'll introduce him anyway. So our third incredible panelist is Kai Zhang from Australia. So he was born in China and migrated to Australia in 2002 as an international student. So he became a partner at PwC Australia in 2012. Prior to that, he worked in a leading Australian law firm. So Kai is also based in Sydney and focuses on advising high net worth families and private enterprises and has extensive experience in tax planning, IPOs, and mergers and acquisitions. 
So as you can see, we have an absolutely incredible panel today who are all excited to share their insights with you into their incredible careers, insights into consulting and investing industries and personal advice. So don't forget, if you have questions for TGCC or our panelists, please drop them in the Q&A box and we'll have time for a live Q&A at the end of the session. So let's get started. So first we'll start off with a general question for all the panelists. So we'll go across the panel for this. Um, and that is, what do you enjoy the most about your roles in your respective company? So we'll start with Martin. Uh, thank you, Henry. Welcome everyone, um, wherever you may be, morning, afternoon, evening. Um, I'm the oldest guy in the room here, um, hence why I've got no hair. So, um, uh, you know, I've, I'm delighted to be part of, of such a, you know, a spirited and entrepreneurial group of people who are interested in careers in consulting and investing. So we'll see if we can give you some color and, and um, some insight into what that looks like this morning or this evening for you. Um, so to your question, Henry, look, the, the great thing about investing is that ultimately you end up looking at a lot of different companies, a lot of different markets, a lot of different commercial and business challenges. And it is incredibly diverse, incredibly challenging and super exciting. So, you know, I, I spent my career initially as an executive in some reasonably large firms, and I was working in one industry with one set of issues or opportunities. And as I've developed my career now towards the tail end of my career, now I'm in this hugely diverse field of interesting things. So, you know, getting up every day is pretty easy, right? Because you come up and you've got, you've got things going on in your head, You've got exciting stuff in front of you. You're learning every minute, every day. Uh, it, it really is a fabulous career. And I think consulting and investing both lead itself to that, to that style of, of, of working. So, you know, I, I heartily would recommend uh, these career paths for anyone who wants diversity and wants challenge and wants to be tested every day. Thank you, Martin. Definitely sounds like a very, very interesting industry to be in. Uh, how about you, Lauren? Yeah, I mean, well, firstly, I would say uh, thanks thanks for having me this morning and, and very, very happy to be here with all of you. Same as Martin, I, I couldn't, couldn't recommend more a career in consulting or investing. And so great to have this opportunity to talk a little bit more with you about it. I, I, I completely second everything that's been said. One of the great things that I've at least found in my consulting career is there's never a dull moment. The, the question's always changing. And so for those of you with a growth mindset who are curious, who love to learn, um, you know, this is a great career to consider. I think, uh, you know, that there can be a challenge in other careers that you're expected to get incredibly specialised and expert at the thing you do, but then you do it just repeatedly over and over again. Um, I found one of the most uh, one of the one of the most fantastic parts of being a consultant is the skill set stays the same, the question and the challenge and the client's always changing and that keeps it fresh. But for me, the other big thing is uh, what I love about consulting is it's a team sport. Uh, we have lots of curious, like-minded people who join and and you know you, you crack hard problems together. Uh, and that's that's a fantastic part of of the the job is is getting to work with a lot of other incredibly intelligent you know switched on like minded people who love to crack a good problem and working alongside them. So I think that's another really um, really important part of why I've always loved and and haven't left consulting is because. Um, the quality of the people you get to work with every day and, you know, the clients you get to interact with, it's just wonderful um, and it keeps it interesting. People, people is what keeps it fresh and real. Thanks, Lauren. And, yeah, it's definitely very exciting for those students here today who are registered for the Tiger Global Case Comm. I think that's really going to give them a taste of what working in the industry is going to be like. Um, I noticed that Kai has just joined us. So, Kai, glad to have you here. Um, right now, um, so a question for you is, what do you enjoy the most about your role in your company? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Harry. Sorry for uh, being light. I, I logged on to a different uh, link. <laughs> and why there? Uh, no one uh, obviously attending. No um, yeah, so I reflect on that. I, I, I'm a partner with uh, PwC, and I'm 42 years old. I've been with PwC for, for 10 years, so absolutely the longest uh, job I have ever held. 
um, what keeps me sort of getting up every every morning uh, is really the the intellectual uh, stimulus. I think a uh, never dull moment uh, is uh, is I think a fitting description of our uh, our work life. Um, it's also a bit like I think life uh, fast forward because we as a consultant as a trust advisors you get to see. Uh, clients and enterprise enterprises in different stage of their life. You know, sometimes we help uh, startup companies with only one or two people, and uh, uh, more often than not, we're helping uh, global multinational companies with uh, thousands and thousands of people. Um, and uh, you know, we obviously work uh, in between the sizes. So, so it's really uh, it's great to to sort of get you know uh, interaction with ambitious entrepreneurs, very capable uh, managers, uh, the global network, et cetera. So it's really uh, a very unique experience. Uh, you, it's very difficult to get as a uh, as a uh, company itself. I think as a consultant give you that bird's eye view of how the business world uh, is happening global level uh, on a real time basis. It's very exciting. Thanks, Kai. Yeah, definitely agree with you there. I think the scope and the range of the work that you get to do, as Martin and Moran also alluded to, is definitely uh, very wide and very interesting. So I'll pose the next question to Martin. So could you explain to our listeners what venture capital is and how it differs to other jobs like consulting, investment banking, or private equity? Yeah, sure. Happy, happy to do so, um, Henry. Let, let, let me go right back to fundamentals. So the, I, might, I might take a little bit longer to answer this question that, than you were hoping, but I think I'll explain how venture capital funds come together and what they look to do. So the first thing to know is that venture capital ultimately is applied at different levels of the maturity of any company. So it could be what we call at seed stage, which is when the company is effectively still developing its product or its service, and it's determining whether it has what we call product market fit, i.e. is what I'm creating going to be consumed or purchased by the end market. So that's seed. And then once you get through that, you go to what they call various series of investment. And typically, the, the language that gets used, series A, series B, series C, is really just the maturity of the investment. But for the later investments, Cs, Ds, sometimes Es, Fs, unusual to get to that level because normally companies have gone public at that point if they're successful. Um, really means the check is bigger and the valuation is bigger is, is the way that broadly works. So when a venture capital uh, fund establishes, the first thing it does is it has to raise money. And it raises money from typically for a, a very new fund, it would raise money from ultra high net wealth families or investors. Um, and sometimes what we call institutional investors, that's unusual for early funds, but typically would raise money and it raises money on the premise that says, look, we're experienced managers. We know what to look for. We've been there before. So typically the managers of a venture fund have had past experience with um, a particular opportunity or, or, or being an entrepreneur themselves. And they always start with an objective of what their return would look like. And I, I talk about their economic return. So um, most of you on this call, I'm sure are familiar with internal rate of return, but it's almost like the annualized return of the fund. And everyone sets out to say, we're going to generate 30% returns. And they all say that, right? So, um, but unfortunately in the real world, actually not that many do get north of 30% returns. So if you're, if you're a fund and let's just imagine for a minute, you're a hundred million dollar fund and you've got a 30% return and your typical fund life might be seven years. Then at the end of seven years, you should have returned circa four to five million to that investor who put a million dollars in. And that's about a 30% annualized rate of return. So it's a pretty good outcome, right? So now the reason I explain that is that that also describes that you only get those level of returns if you take risk. And risk in venture is really um, the, key, the key feature of a venture capital fund. Uh, private equity, growth equity, other type of investment funds usually take a lower risk and one way to think about that, if you've got a fund with, say, 10 portfolio companies, you would reasonably expect as a venture capital fund that two or three of those will go to zero. And what I mean by that is they will fail and you won't get your money back. But you also reasonably expect, ideally, that two or three of the 10 become what we love to call unicorns or 10 baggers, 
which means they've outsized returns. So these are like the Canvas and the Ubers and the Airbnbs of the world, where if you invest early and they go terrifically well, then they become massive outsized returns for the fund. And then you've got some in the middle that possibly do reasonably well, but not spectacularly well. And when you average the returns of all of those portfolio companies, you end up with a smoothed out return profile, which hopefully is north of the 30% that you set as your objective when you start the fund. And if you're good at doing that, then you'll be able to raise a second fund and a third fund and a fourth fund. And then what you see is the most successful venture capital funds in the world have been able to progress their way from normally quite a modest early fund, one, to a more substantial fund, two, more substantial fund, three, fund four, fund five, et cetera. And you'd be familiar with some of the biggest names in venture capital. So it is about risk. Um, it, you can't go in to venture unless you accept that there is risk. And if you don't do that, then you become so risk averse that actually you'll never make the right investments and you'll never make um, the right decisions along the journey to help you maximize your success. So you've got to be very open about that and very aware of that. And there are some terrific companies that early um, on went to some of the biggest venture capital funds in the world and they didn't uh, elect to invest. And those companies went on to be hugely successful. So that happens all the time. And you can't, as a venture capitalist, ever worry about that. You can only look at the deal that's in front of you. You form a view. You decide to either invest or not. And if you do, then you get right behind that and do everything you can to make that successful. And if you don't, you move on to the next opportunity. And there's always a next opportunity. So hopefully that just gives you a bit of color. Um, it's, it's a terrifically interesting, interesting industry. Um, and it's becoming more relevant now because we're seeing through technology a lot more companies, a lot more disruptive business models, a lot more entrepreneurs who are just looking at things differently that need capital to grow. And that's where venture capital fits in. Thanks for that, Martin. And we'll definitely circle back a bit later on to kind of explore how you approach uh, individual companies and how you evaluate them. Uh, first, though, I've got a question for Lauren. So as a consultant, you've taken on projects for companies in a wide range of industries. So you know, you've got financial services, retail and telecommunications. So in many cases, executives you're working with have a lot of experience in their respective industries already. So how do you still try to add value as a consultant in those cases? Yeah, thanks, Henry. I think that's um, it's a classic question and certainly one that I was asking before I joined. So I'm glad that you've asked it and we can we can talk about this group. Um, and there are a few different ways to think about this question. I think the first one, um, at least my experience has been that the role of the consultant um, is often to connect the client with amazing experts that firms like McKinsey have access to. So, you know, in, in any, you know, big consulting firm like McKinsey, you'll have partners like myself who are um, very well versed in strategic thinking and analysis and are going to do that for the client. But you'll also have partners who are, you know, genuinely have reached that role only because they're globally recognised as experts in their field and have gone very deep. And one of the values of that is, you know, they are absolutely experts in the discipline that your clients work in, but they've done it all over the world. So they've seen everything and they can say, hey, here are patterns that have emerged in markets that are analogous to yours or different from yours that you can learn from. Um, and bring global reach to helping the team. So I think that sort of one is you you wouldn't want to ever think of consulting back to my comment about it team being a team sport. It's it's not what Lauren advises. It's it's bringing you know we call it bringing the best of McKinsey, but you know bringing the best of big, these global consulting firms and really deploying world class experts who can. Um, try and apply learnings that, that they've built over, you know, many different engagements and, and seeing clients globally. And then the second thing is, I think uh, sometimes we underestimate how important it is to have outside challenge um, from a couple of angles, really, you know, one is when you're, it's, it's lonely at the top. And it's really hard sometimes, I think, to get people who work for you to be brutally honest about things to do with their own portfolio and what might be going wrong. Um, but the other thing is just, you know, working across industries, it can be really helpful 
to bring a fresh perspective and say, hey, you're, you're very focused in your industry. Are you thinking about the fact that, you know, modern consumers actually don't compare, for example, banks to other banks. They also compare them to what it's like when they go on Netflix and they also compare them to what it's like when they go on Amazon. So what lessons are you taking from the way they work with customers and the experience they provide and making sure that you're really delivering the best of the best, not just comparing yourself to other banks and giving yourself a pat on the back? So that's actually another really important part of the job is that adds a lot of value is actually comparing across industries and providing points of challenge uh, that are very different from what they're, they're getting day to day. So I think uh, when you put that together, that, that I think that's one of the reasons why there's sort of continued to be a role is, you know, now more than ever, people are looking for global input. I think it's really come to the fore with COVID, you know, one of the roles we've been playing is connecting clients globally who are all having to respond to COVID in incredibly different ways. But nevertheless, you know, there's virtually no industry out there that's walked out of COVID unscathed saying this hasn't affected how my consumers engage with my product. This hasn't affected how I do business um, and being able to, to drive those connections and those learnings and, and uh, make, make global links for them has also been sort of a huge source of insight. So I would actually say um, now more than ever it's not a problem we've had of, of finding ways to be relevant and drive value, even for people who spend their whole life thinking about how they can run their company better. Um, there's still enormous ways that outsiders can add, can add value to them. Thanks, Lauren. Definitely some very good points there. Um, my next question is for Kaim. So as a partner at PwC, uh, can you describe the key decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis? So for example, what does your typical week look like? Okay. Uh, thank you, Henry. Um, this is not really a, a typical week. I, I find that every week uh, seems to be very different. Uh, I might just quickly describe uh, my last week. Um, it, it's a very, uh, if you live in Australia, we have this uh, funny thing called financial year and which is early June. So very different to other parts of the world. So last week, just after the end of the financial year, so a lot of things happening. Um, just looking at my calendar, so I had a, a team. I uh, had a team conference uh, to to go through um, uh, the year end performance writings for everyone uh, in my team. I also have a team conference with the financial part of the firm to discuss uh, how we performed uh, as a group for financial uh, for the uh, last financial year. And uh, also, I had a discussion with my uh, boss to discuss. Um, the uh, setting of budget for, for the next financial year. Right? For, for the young students on the call, this is uh, boring, but I promise you a very important part of, of the responsibility as a partner is to so set, set KPIs uh, for, for revenue, for expense control, which is difficult in a you know, COVID uh, setting. I also had a client a teleconference to discuss a pitch document. So, so in that case, we are trying to get a risk management uh, software implementation gig for a uh, leading financial institution based in Sydney. Uh, so we had a call with the client um, and we discussed their needs. Uh, we need to understand you know, what are their requirements. And as I go, go on the call, I need to make uh, decisions quickly as to what are the things we can help them with and what will be the ballpark uh, costs and, and time frame to give them what they need. Uh, also had a teleconference call to follow up on a large uh, tender document. Uh, this has been a project going on for six months now. So there's a lot of back and forth, a very large uh, enterprise needs a fully integrated service in relation to a MNA uh, transaction. Um, so this, we, you know, last week we probably submitted our version uh, seven of our tender document. Um, uh, we also had our team team call last week, uh, a, a weekly call, so where we go through key market uh, initiatives, uh, what our competitors are, are doing, some of the um, what, you know where, where some uh, what our key customers uh, where they're up to, what they're doing, um, and also uh, new uh, new business uh, ideas, uh, new growth ideas uh, we discuss with the uh, members of uh, my team. 
Um, also had various uh, team calls uh, where we discuss uh, draft uh, deliverables uh, before they go to clients. So as a partner, I, I suppose we are the uh, gate, uh, uh, the goalkeepers uh, for any um, a problem in in a uh, what, what, we, what we call deliverables. So we, we as partners, you need to challenge and test the assumptions uh, in the uh, in those uh, uh, advices. You have to review the methodologies and approaches you use. You need to make sure that you're comfortable with those. Uh, and they're also very important, uh, very important that you, know, you need to make sure that these advices are not only technically correct, but they actually are commercial as well. So can be uh, can be used. Um, it's not, you know, it's it's not uh, of much value if you give people technically correct uh, advice, but they can't apply that to the to the real commercial commercial world. Um, I suppose, look, um, you know, my past week, uh, to me, I feel really busy, but uh, to you on the call, uh, probably uh, you'll find it boring, not exciting, uh, but that's, um, uh, you know, that's, that's um, you know, that's, that's not true. I, I, when I'm doing, you know, going through client proposals, when I'm talking to my team, uh, teammates uh, on team calls, when we reflect on what we achieved in an otherwise very challenging FY21, and when we, uh, you know, cast our uh, forecast on the year to come, uh, I feel that it's all, it's all very meaningful, meaningful work. Uh, also, uh, in a, uh, in a in a large uh, partnership um, like PwC, we have seven thousand people in Australia, and about four hundred or five hundred partners are thereabouts. Um, I, I very much like the autonomy. Um, so, Harry, it's a good question. When you know you you do make day to day uh, decisions as you go as partner as owners of the of the business, uh, and uh, I pretty much feel like uh, owner of a small business, uh, but in a very large network. So, we can be very small. Where I make those very micro uh, decisions, um, which will only impact one or two people or one or two clients, but you know, occasionally we also, um, as partnership, we 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 will go out and work with other uh, partners and their teams, and we uh, to collectively we make much larger uh, decisions and be responsible uh, for those decisions. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there, Kai. Um, I think it definitely, it does sound very busy and very kind of challenging work, but I think, um, you know, if you can step back after a week and look at what you've accomplished, and in your case, you've certainly done a lot during that week, um, I think it is definitely very rewarding. So I'll circle back to Martin now. Um, so as you mentioned before, um, the fail rate for a lot of investments, uh, particularly in venture capital, is very high. Um, so risk is very high. And so one stat actually says that over 90% of new startups so as a VC investor, how do you approach managing a portfolio and what do you look for in uh, evaluating individual companies? Yeah, thanks again, Henry. Yeah, look, I don't know where that stat came from. I think it's one of those made up stats, right? No one really knows. But but I, but I suspect that, um, you know, for people who put capital into businesses, you know, there is a high failure rate, right? I mean, and even if everyone thinks about even just cafes, for example, how many cafes do you know? They're startups. And people start a cafe and they shut down because they can't they can't make it work. So you know, unfortunately, that happens in business, and that is commerce. That's what we all live in. People uh, apply capital and their um, their their intellect to business opportunities, and some will succeed and some will not. And the best entrepreneurs, and this is interesting, the best entrepreneurs sometimes are the ones who have had a failure and have learned from that failure and come back again. So we, as a venture capital investor, quite like when someone says, I had a previous firm and it didn't work. And I find that pretty interesting. And I explore what happened and I form a view, well, does that entrepreneur now have a much more learned kind of approach to the second opportunity or the third opportunity? So failure is not bad in venture. It's, I mean, we prefer, I'm sure the entrepreneur prefers that they didn't fail, but it isn't the end of the road, right? So that's really important. And that also leads to, I guess, the foundation of your question. What's the most important thing we look for? There are probably a few things that um, I can summarize here. The first is we genuinely back people and teams, right? So I've got a simple statement I like to make that I'll always back a good team 
with a bad product rather than a good product with a bad team. Because a good team will figure out how to change that bad product to a good product. Because good teams do that, right? So there's another bit of a cliche out there, back jockeys, not horses, right? So it's not the horse that's going to win, it's the jockey on the horse that's going to make it win. Inventory is actually really important. So team is really important. So big part of what we evaluate uh, evaluate is who are the who are the founders what's their skills what's their experience do we think that they can lead this company to success the second and very important attribute is do we believe that the market opportunity that they're pr prosecuting is substantial uh, in other words how big is it is it a global problem is it a local problem um the bigger the better obviously so we call that tam total addressable market or tam you hear of that a lot what's your tam and that's just a question of how big is the opportunity here the bigger the better the third most important um, element is well what demonstration do they have right now that what they've created or are creating fits the problem so is the problem real and is their product or their service somehow unique that allows them to be able to succeed in being able to sell their product or service to that large market? So they're probably the three most important, simple, memorable concepts that we look at. If you can get comfortable with those three, then there's a whole bunch of other things we look at. We look at who other investors are in this opportunity, do we like those investors? Are they of the same uh, like-minded view as us on that? Because there's nothing worse than coming into a company where one investor wants to go that way and the other investor wants to go that way. And the poor founder in the middle doesn't know which way he's going, right? So they're little issues that we look at. But if we solve for those three big issues, great team, big market opportunity, clear problem and demonstrated, demonstrated traction, that's a pretty good start. Thanks, Martin. Um, so the next question is for Lauren. So what are the key skills you need to succeed as a consultant and how can students prepare now? It's a great question. Uh, so beyond what you're doing through competitions like this, which I think is a lot around honing your analytics and uh, your ability to think conceptually and problem solve, you need to sort of think of some other dimensions of what can help you to succeed in the role. Um, and it sounds cliched, but, you know, having a degree in business or commerce or economics is really just the beginning. Um, what, what I found sets apart the stars that I work with versus other, other people I've worked with is a few things. One, most importantly, just building on something Martin said about teams being the key, most of the time versus product. I mean, I've said before, it really is a team sport. What that means for you is it's great to get more exposure to working really effectively with other people. So how can you do things like this where you compete in teams and, um, and you can really get experience working with others? I, I actually think of that incredibly broadly, by the way. So that could be work experience opportunities where you have to be part of a team. It could also be sporting teams. You know, there are, there are many things that you can do. I did a lot of debating. That's another a great example of a, of a team activity. And really what you're doing is you're learning to work well with others because no two humans are alike. We all have these little idiosyncrasies or things that, um, that make us who we are, but also mean that we have little bugbears that we don't like. And so one, one fantastic skill in life is finding ways to work really effectively with others understand them, understand what motivates them, share the same about yourself and find ways to collaborate really effectively. So team players who work really well with others is one thing we absolutely look for. The second one um, is around resilience and the ability to overcome challenges and obstacles. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I think that what really attracts me to consulting but also could be quite daunting is Typically, we don't get asked to come in and do work when everything's going super well. 
So no one goes, yep, yeah, we've bought you in. We want to we want to spend lots of money. And the reason we've done that is because we've got no issues. It's all going really well. We've got no hard problems to crack. We, we know exactly what we should do. So we actually get called in when a, a lot of other people have looked at and gone, this is a tough one, guys. I think we need some more help. Um, and so what that means is we, we look for people who've built that muscle of being able to come at problems from many different angles. And when they see a problem and the, the solution isn't obvious, actually that doesn't daunt them. They go, okay, well, you know, what are 10 ways I could come at this to try and get to a solution? So building that muscle of resilience. Um, and again, I don't, I don't think of this as one that can only be built, you know, in a classroom or through, you know, through learning official problem solving. I actually think to the point Martin made before, being able to pick yourself back up off the ground and give it another shot is, is a huge part of this one. So um, what that is about is um, putting yourself out there and having a go at things. So actually seeking out challenges. Um, and I think in life, one of the things that I have always taken with me is if you're setting yourself challenges and you always succeed, you're probably not setting yourself big enough challenges, you know? So actually in life, I probably have learned a lot more from the times when I tried to do something and failed than when I tried to do something and succeeded and it felt great. <laughs> um, and so I would actually um, recommend, you know, if you're thinking about how, how can I really supercharge my development might sound counterintuitive, but it, it's probably worth sitting down and saying, what, what challenges and goals am I setting myself? And actually, are they are they challenging enough? Are they aggressive enough? Have I, if I'm 100% certain that I can achieve all the goals I've set, have I really stretched myself or have I just set myself goals that I thought I could achieve? So um, those would be two things as you think about really how I'm going to set myself up, not just for my first job, but for a really successful career. Uh, those would be a couple of things I'd be thinking about um as, as you kind of set out on your on your next adventure thanks lauren and so the last question before we move on to the live q a is for kai so kai you've had a lot of experience in m a deals and foreign investments in australia so how do these typically affect tax considerations for a company okay thank you henry uh I'm biased, but I, I think M&A tax is probably the most uh, intellectually uh, challenging and the rewarding part of uh, corporate tax. Uh, that's true, at least in Australia. Uh, you know, uh, for example, you know, if if I'm doing an M&A &A transaction, how I will be funding the transaction? Uh, should I use 100% of my own money, or or as, as share share equity in the target company, or should I be uh, use partly of my own money and partly uh, still my own money, but I I do a shareholder loan into the into the uh, acquisition entity. Uh, if I decide to borrow money externally, uh, should I try to borrow money locally or internationally? Uh, in what market and in what currency should I borrow? Uh, if I'm a US company acquiring a Australian target, where do I base my acquisition entity? My parent is in US. I know my target is in Australia, uh, but should there be a middle uh, entity? Should, it, should that middle entity be in the US, Singapore, UK, or British Virgin Islands? Uh, if, I'm a, doing it, if I'm buying a target company, should I be buying its shares or should I be buying the underlying assets? Uh, if I have to choose uh, between minimizing my tax on future dividend income stream of the assets I'm investing or minimizing my tax on future sale of the asset, uh, there's very, uh, there's, and they can give rise to very different uh, structuring uh, outcomes. So, so it's a bit like a playing Lego, you know, you have, as a tax person, you have, uh, you know, various uh, pieces uh, uh, that you can, you know, help help uh, help clients to to uh, uh, to to you know to bring to a certain shape and form, and so we inspire each other. So we will give uh, clients some you know suggestions as to what are the uh, broad uh, what are the broad um, options available uh, in in the in, in the tax world, and as the M and A. You know, we, we work, uh, as the MNA team, we work very closely with the investment bankers, and um, so they sort of give the commercial set of the commercial parameters uh, for 
for sort of where the level of peace needs to fall for the for the MN for the MNA to occur. Okay. Thanks, Kai. Um, so now we'll move on to the live Q&A. So we'll just take the top uh, voted questions from the Q&A box. So guys, uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please remember to drop them into the Q&A box and upvote the questions that um, have already been asked, but you also want to have answered. So the first one is from Timothy. So uh, I know that both investment banking and consulting is a very stressful, pressured and intense environment. So how do you manage those pressures? So I'll pose this question to Lauren. Uh, I think it's a pretty personal thing how you do it, but I'm happy to offer up my reflections on what I found works. Um, I think one of the really important things that you can do is to think about how you gain perspective. Um, and one of the things that's really helped me is to step back from what it is I'm doing. And I invest an enormous amount in my work um, and it's very important. And the clients I support, I think of them as much more than just a job. But at the end of the day, um, I have perspective on, on where that is in my life. And, you know, um, what's much more important to me is my family and my friends. I could work away, I could walk away from my job tomorrow and the most critical parts of my life, you know, what's, what's, what's critical to who I am and my identity would still be intact. So the first thing is to kind of put whatever challenge it is that you're facing, you know, it's one deal or one client that's part of my job, which actually is only just one part of my life. Um, and to try and in those moments, um, keep that perspective, because it can be that you feel like the world is falling down around you and you sort of have to take a deep breath and put everything in perspective. So that's one. Um, the second one is just to find really natural ways um, to, to de-stress. Um, and so I actually think that funnily enough, the people that you find who stay in things like investment banking and, and um, case manager over the long haul are the ones who find time to carve out for things like, for example, exercise. So to find ways to, to get um, adrenaline and anxiety out of their system, that it could be meditation, it could be exercise, but these are, these are sort of natural and healthy ways to kind of deal with stress. Um, I think the, the people who I've observed who start to walk away in the long run are those who end up with some unhealthy ways to de-stress. So they sort of um, end up using things like retail therapy or, uh, dare I say, it, alcohol or other things to sort of um, self-soothe. And I think the big um, distinction that I draw, I've, I've certainly used them over the time, is are you developing really um, healthy avenues to release stress and kind of help keep yourself in balance versus those ones that um, feel a little bit more like band-aids. Um, it's, it's definitely true, or at least I found that um, a new dress or a pair of heels will, will give me a very short-lived pick-me-up, um, but it's not a strategy for being, at least for me, I found, for being happy. So finding ways to carve out that time. Um, and they do say that if you want something done, give it to a busy person. I've also found that to be true. So. What I mean by that is, um, you know, even when you're really busy, you can normally carve out, I'm not saying go, go play a round of golf, but you can normally carve out time to get to the gym or run to work or run home from your last meeting um, or do 10 minutes of meditation. It's actually not a, a long time. And those kind of building in those healthy habits each day, I think are what allow you to make it sustainable over sort of um, 10 or 20 years versus a couple of years um, as an analyst. So those are my reflections of just what's worked for me. Can I, can I jump in, Henry? Yep, sure. Um, really good advice, really good advice, right? So I, I, I suspect that every one of you on this webinar, by definition of the fact you're here and you're interested, are probably the right type of person who will embrace the workload and the pressure that comes to this industry, right? So. People in consulting, people in investing work very hard. They work hard because they enjoy what they do. And that's the key, right? If you don't enjoy it, don't do it. Go do something else, right? Find what you love, find what you enjoy and do it and do it well. And don't worry about the pressure because you thrive on that pressure. I, I would be stressed if I was bored the other way around, right? I don't get stressed because I'm busy. 
I get stressed when I'm not busy, funnily enough. And, and even to Lauren's point, I'll share with you, that's what I do. I jump on my spin bike when I'm really needing to unlead, un unleash a little bit of, of, uh, of my adrenaline, right? So you're on this call, all of you, because you're interested in this field, which probably tells me that you're all people who are, have got good intellect, good ambition, good spirit. And so the, these fields, they're not the only fields, there are other, you'll have other choices in life. Um, but they're really good fields. The last point I'd like to make is that you're not making a decision for the rest of your life. You're making a decision for now. And that might change. And you may change over time. And don't feel that whatever you choose to do coming out of your current schooling or education is setting you up for the rest of your life. It doesn't work like that. I started as a computer programmer 40 years ago, right? And I didn't know what I really wanted to do, but I went and did computer programming when languages like COBOL, none of you would have heard of that. It was 40 years ago, right? But now I'm a venture capitalist. Well, I never assumed 40 years ago I'd be a venture capitalist. I didn't think I'd do that. I'm, I'm a board director on some large companies like KPMG. I never thought I'd do that. But you go with the journey and the journey will take you wherever you wish to go. But that key, I want to come back to it, is you must enjoy and love what you do. Thanks, Martin, um, and Lauren as well, are both very good pieces of advice. Um, so the next question I'll pose to Kai first, um, but yes, uh, if anyone else wants to jump in, please feel free. Um, so this question is, if you were paid a regular wage, would you still truly enjoy your work? So I'll let Kai take this one first. Um, if I'm paid a regular wage, if I'm not paid a regular wage, Oh, uh, so if you were paid a regular wage, yeah. Um, so uh, would you still truly enjoy your work? Uh, I probably cannot afford to keep working <laughs> if I don't get paid. Um, yes, I, I do, as I mentioned uh, before. I think um, I mean, at end of day, um, you know, um, end of day, I think work defined for adults, that's work defined who you are. Uh, and what kind of person you are. If you think about it, we, uh, this is before COVID, obviously, you spend more time at workplace uh, than you spend time with, with, with your kids, with your, with your spouse. Uh, and I think that's true for, for a lot of people, especially in the uh, finance and, and the consulting uh, industry. So if, if you don't enjoy what you do uh, in the uh, waking hours uh, of your life, then, then that's a terrible life, life to live. Um, obviously, the best position is where you enjoy what you do, you're good at what you do, and you get paid for it. So if you get, can get to the trifecta on that, you, you, uh, I think you're set for a very uh, happy life. Thanks, Kai. Yeah. Um, and and then just, want... Harry, on the last question, just uh, if I can add a couple catch-up comments um, uh, you know, after Lauren and Martin. Um, I want to show uh, people this. This is a calculator. When I was uh, our audience age, my mom was a business woman, and she said, "Kai, you'll never be good at accounting because you can't use the calculator well." Um, my 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 fingers are, are are pretty clumsy, so so I'm probably much slower than the average kid uh, when I'm punching on a, on a calculator. But time has changed. Now we use um, you know Excel and other. Uh, uh, as Martin said, pro we use a lot of we, we hire a lot of programmers at professional accounting firms nowadays, uh, and so so don't don't listen to people who tell you you can't get into finance or consulting or whatever you want to do just because uh, they are based on their own experience. And we living in this world, things are changing very fast. So don't listen to you know people of Kai's age and uh, <laughs> I think pursue your own uh, aspiration and dreams because the future world will be yours. Thanks Kai, definitely agree with you. Uh, so the next question is from Ardit. So I'll pose this one to Martin first. Uh, so what qualities do you look for in international undergraduate students who apply to consulting firms uh, for internal or for grad roles? Um, so Look, I can only really answer this from um, one of my, so not from the venture capital perspective, but from the uh, professional services perspective. So just to let everyone know, I'm a, I'm a board director of KPMG Australia. So I'm not a consultant. I've never been a consultant, um, but I'm 
involved in KPMG at a level where we do hire a lot of graduates, you know, circa more, more than 500 a year. And I'm sure PwC, EY, Deloitte, and all the other, McKinsey's, Bain, all hire material amount of graduates. It's very competitive, right? The quality of the candidates that come into that process are very, very good, right? And so the first and most important thing to do is get very, if, if you're interested in doing that and, and, and putting yourself forward for any of those firms or anyone like that, is that recognize that you've got to stand out a little bit. So the way to do that, and the first thing to do is be very familiar with the process that each of those firms is running in order to evaluate graduates. And typically that's a really structured program. It might involve an application a year ahead, and it might involve a series of webinars and a series of, of interviews that kind of lead up to the final decision. And you've got to be very, very well prepared. Do your best, right? Do your best, Get, give yourself the best chance. Um, clearly, we look for people who probably shine a little bit, right? Just have a little bit of more than the next person. That might be not only what they've done in life, but also just attitudes. So you can see it. You can see a person who's got a little bit of positivity, a general sense of being able to be to, to be able to work through any problem. What Lauren described earlier on, I would call resilience, right? The ability to cope with things that don't go well. And so there's a whole series of interview questions and processes that look to kind of unpack that and come up with the people that we think can be the best to do what we do. And we don't always get it perfectly right, of course, right? Because people are making choices. But I think if you take the, the, the process really seriously, you, you, you recognize that um, it's going to be very competitive and you think about all of those things that you've done in life and you'd like to do in life and you focus on that then you'll give yourself every likelihood that you can succeed in, in um, getting an opportunity. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Lauren or Kai, did you guys have any um, responses to that as well? Kai, do you want to go first? Yeah, okay. Um, I agree with uh, uh, Martin's uh, comment, absolutely. I think we are, I mean, you know, 20 years ago, uh, you know, a firm like PwC is predominantly focused on assurance and audit. So naturally it will hire lots of grads from uh, an accounting background. Uh, nowadays, I think audit is about 30% of our business and consulting is 30% and tax legal is 30%. And, and when I spoke to my uh, consulting colleagues, they actually prefer people from diverse uh, backgrounds, including engineering, uh, programming, um, uh, math, uh, uh, science, uh, so that they can, you know, the grads can bring their uh, level, ex you know, the fields of expertise on consulting uh, uh, engagements to help the clients. So, so tax and legal is probably more uh, law law focused. It's very tax rich, and Australian tax law is notoriously complex. We have. Probably, you know, our tax law is about income tax law alone is about 10,000 pages. Crazy for a 25 million uh, population country. But anyway, so 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 we do hire a lot of uh, still hire a lot of law grads, uh, double degree law grads for tax and legal. Assurance, I think, is uh, still a lot of accounting, but I find them starting to uh, recruit a more diverse background uh, candidates, and consulting is is very diverse already. Thanks, Kyle. Lauren? Probably what I'd add, just um, building on, on what Martin said of standing out, is tying back to well, what, what would recruiters be looking for? And I think it's great to think of yourself almost a little bit like a product. Um, and to be honest, everyone out there, you know, applying for your roles, it's, it's kind, of, kind of becoming table stakes that you've um, got a degree and, and you've done well. Um, and so what's going to set your product apart are those other aspects of who you are. Um, and so it's really important to be showcasing evidence, you know, in your resume that you put in and throughout the process, you know, um, how have I demonstrated that I can work well in team scenarios? How have I demonstrated that I can um, bounce back from, from challenges, or overcome adversity? Um, have, I showed, have I showed leadership? Um, and be as creative as you can in that. I think that um, to the point Martin made, everyone is trying really earnestly to, to try and hire the right people, you know, as defined by what they're really looking for. So they're really trying to engage with your, your resume and 
truly understand who you are and you know what your skill set is. So um, do your best to give them what they need to figure out if you'd be a good fit. So you know that that doesn't mean that you need to um, just have have lots of kind of medals or accomplishments on your CV. You know great ones that prove resilience and ability to work in teams like what work experience have I done? What extracurricular activities or contributions am I making to my community? You know, have I shown my ability to be part of a team through, you know, extracurricular activities or sports I could do? So I think the more well-rounded you can be, the better off that that you'll be in putting yourself forward as a candidate. And um, to be honest, a lot of that takes time. You know, you can't you can't wait, wake up a few months before your application is is due and and only then start working on you know experience in teams experience giving back to your communities other extracurriculars and work experience so I guess one one thing I would say is I, I think you have the, the privilege of um, starting young you know you've still got enough time to really think broadly about well what is the grab bag of experiences I want to develop over the next couple of years and um, your education is probably just one aspect of that. So I would encourage you to all think quite deeply about, you know, um, how am I going to build up different parts of what ultimately will be my product? It's not just my education. I also need to, you know, get experience working in teams, being a leader and, and, and having other life experiences. And that's what will set me apart when I apply. Great. Thanks, Lauren. And thank you, Martin and Kai as well. I think that's all the time um, we have today. So thank you all so much for participating. Um, huge thank you to all of our panelists again. Um, thank you for taking the time to share your expertise and insights. Um, I'm sure it will inspire a lot of students today. So thank you for that. So the recording of this webinar will also be sent to all registrants on Monday. So what's next? So first, make sure that you are following TGCC on Instagram. And also make sure that you are registered for TGCC, the world's largest virtual global case competition for high school students. So registrations close on August the 3rd and there will be no exception. So first, gather your team of two to four students and secondly, head to the TGCC website to register. So you can scan this QR code on the screen here or you can go to the website casecom.org. So work with your team to crack the business case and learn about cutting edge technology at TGCC 2021, the future of mobility. So also make sure to check out global prizes, mentorship sessions with global leaders, internships, cash prizes, and much, much more on the website. So register for TGCC now, don't miss out. Lastly, TGCC would like to thank the sponsors and partners that are making TGCC 2021 possible. So that's our principal partner, Cargo Global Management, Global Partner, m and Investments, official sponsor PwC and powered by Crimson Education. See you all at TGCC 2021. Thank you all for joining.